then after the flood, people killed them, mo most of them. They were called dragons through most of history. Uh, the word dinosaur wasn't even made up till 1841. So for most of history, they're called dragons, and people killed them. And I think there could be a few stragglers still alive today, like Loch Ness Monster and the one that washed up on California. And you can see my video number three and get all that. Thank you. Kyle. With, the, uh, with regard to the seven-day week, I, I hope I'm clearly saying that I believe in seven epics. I just believe that they're longer than a 24-hour period of time. As far as the dinosaurs, uh, our ministry teaches that there was a long period of time prior to the advent of man on the earth, which was, by the way, a miracle of God. It's not something that he, man did not evolve. He's not a, a, a separate uh, creature. And um, the time period prior to man's advent here included uh, many multiple species walking across the earth, including dinosaurs. And I have no uh, concerns whatsoever that, that God could bring them to the earth and, and um, choose whatever means he chose to to remove them from the earth. Michael. Yeah, um, there's nothing particularly special about seven-day weeks or seven-day cycles or whatever. There's lots and lots of versions of weeks throughout the last 6,000 years of recorded history. Uh, there's nothing sacred or special about seven days. There's no seven-day biological cycle, for example. There's a 30-day, but I don't think that's biblical. Maybe it is. <laughs> um, am I certain that there are no certainties? <laughs> well, uh, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> As for the dinosaurs, yeah, I'd love to know what deck they were on on the ark. Look, you, you guys are really missing the point of, the, of this flood story. You're missing a really good story if you're trying to figure out which deck the dinosaurs were on, how God got the marsupials all the way down to Australia when the boat landed in Mount Ararat over in Turkey. How did they get there? You know, this, this is, you're missing the point of that story. Go back and read it again. It's not about factual biology. It's about something else. All right, the last three. Um, as a biologist, I'm very concerned about Dr. Holden's misunderstanding of the principles of biological evolution. And since I can't make a statement, um, Dr. Shermer, can you explain to Dr. Holden, there's two basic concepts that he isn't understanding. Uh, first of all, he... Getting close to the statement category. <laughs> okay, well, first of all, can you explain that mutation is not about getting better. It's about being advantageous to a changing environment. And from that survival of the fittest is not what we're talking about. It's survival to reproduce. That would work for Jeopardy. That did. Okay. I wanted to thank the doctors for a great discussion. My question is for Dr. Hoven about the flood. Um, you adhere to a literal time scale of uh, 2400 BC for the flood, and yet we have secular history that shows major civilizations and languages before that, um, when the Tower of Babel had to happen after the flood in about 2100 BC, I think you adhere to. But we have uh, cuneiform and hieroglyphics before that. How do you explain the discrepancy between the flood story and the secular history? And you get the last um, Hi. I was hoping for a little bit more of an argument from, or hoping to hear more from um, old, real, old um, world creation. And I was wondering if you could comment on uh, the scripture that says one, um, one day to God is like a thousand years to man. Let's start with Kyle, go to Michael, and finish with Dr. Hoven. Um, I think that does show us that to God, the, the time really isn't as significant of an issue. I think it also shows, uh, you could even work that argument even further and say, well, which 24-hour day did God use? Because our time 24 hours today isn't the same as it was uh, 7,000 years ago even. The, the rotation, the spin of the earth is going shorter. And so I, I also used to wonder, when I first started into this um, process of moving into the old earth paradigm, I used to think, well, what was it about light and day that caused God to need to be on some sort of a clock? I mean, and what if he, he I mean, God forbid, if you'll excuse the expression, but what if he was off schedule? Would he have to, you know, because it, after all, does imply that, that creation was a work, and, and after all, why did he rest at the end of it? Um, and I know that this sounds a little bit crazy, and I don't want to, to, to throw it out to you as heresy, because it would be heresy if I said God was diminished in some way by what he did. What I want to say, in fact, is why is it that we have to be 
so bound up in a, the, the clock, day and night, hours, as if God should have been subscribing to that particular time period, as if it makes it more instantaneous, more magical, and more mystical. When I think we can say whether it gave, he, he took it in 10 billion years or whether he did it in five minutes, all of what we see around us is an incredibly wonderful creation and couldn't have come about one iota of it by chance. Michael. Michael oh, Shermer. Me. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, on the, uh, the, the question of evolution, how does it work? Well, the, there's this misconception of the survival of the fittest. It's not fit as in physically fit or big or strong or fat. It's whatever it takes to get the genes and in the next generation. Whoever leaves behind the most offspring that make it to the next generation and so on wins. There are examples of this. A species, uh, Dr. Hoban said, we don't know what a species is. And we can define a species. A species is a group of actually a potentially interbreeding natural populations reproductively isolated from other such populations. Whatever it takes to reproductively isolate two populations, a mountain range, a hotel chain, an aqueduct, an ocean, a river, whatever, they get separated, they, they, through mutation, they change a little bit, through natural selection they change, variation, sex, uh, and so on. Then if they get back, the river dries up and the populations overlap again. If they've changed too much, they can't interbreed anymore. They are now, by definition, separate species. That is the origin of species right there. We have observed it lots of times in our own lifetime. In the uh, late 1800s, wallabies were Australian wallabies were introduced into Hawaii. Now the uh, Hawaiian wallabies can no longer interbreed because they've tried with Australian wallabies because they've changed too much. New species. That's an example of evolution at work right there. Dr. Hoban. Um, they're still wallabies. That doesn't prove they came from a rock. All right. Uh, I don't know. We're going to leave a lot of questions hanging here, which these things always do, okay? Uh, as far as marsupials to Australia, that's not a problem. Uh, the marsupials are less aggressive than most other mammals, and they would always be at the leading edge of the migration fringe. They're always pushed out of their territory by the more aggressive animals. And as the water's rising after the flood was over, the ice caps are melting. We cover all that in video number six, by the way. Uh, <laughs> They ended up trapped in Australia. That's not a problem at all. It beats, beats the idea that marsupials came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago. As far as the biology, I think I do understand biology, and I resent you saying that I don't understand that. I think, I, I think most people here do clearly understand the, the mechanisms proposed for evolution, and they simply have rejected it because it's devoid of scientific evidence. That statement smacked of a little bit of, hey, I'm smart because I believe it, and you folks are all dumb because you don't believe in it, and I would resent that very much, okay? Secondly, as far as uh, a day as being a 1,000 years, um, I think there are two references, Psalms 90, verse 4, and 2 Peter 3, where it talks about a day as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. Neither of those verses are talking about the creation, number one, and both of them say thousand, not million or billion. So how on earth do you get 17 billion out of those verses? I don't know, okay? <laughs> and as far as limiting God, I'm not the one who limits God. The idea, I think you're stuck on this idea that it, it, it's, the, earth is 17, the universe is 17 billion years old and we have to make the Bible say that somehow. You're the one limiting God to the, the silly evolution theory that's the current vogue. And if everybody would just come to my seminar, we would get them all straightened out <laughs> on that. Now, uh, uh, as is we... Is my time up? Is my time up? Yes. I, <laughs> no, one more. Uh, yeah, drdino.com. The Bible says uh, God gave them up, Psalms 81. He gave them up to their own lust. He gave them up. He gave them up, Romans 1. I think God gives up on people when they choose not to believe in God. Some people just simply don't like God. The Bible says God will send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And if you believe you came from a rock, you're believing a lie, okay? Evolution.